Starship 25 and Super Heavy Booster 9 are waiting for final regulatory approval from the Federal Aviation Administration for liftoff. As mentioned in my previous updates, the FAA plans to complete the final safety review and grant SpaceX a launch license by the end of October. However, SpaceX would still need a separate environmental approval from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service before launching. The agency is conducting a review of the environmental impact of the latest upgrades to the Starbase launch site, particularly the water deluge system. The process could take anywhere from 30 to 135 days to complete. On September 21st, with the help of a crane, teams removed the Starship hot stage ring from the top of Booster 9. For those who are unfamiliar, it is an interstage ring that was mounted on top of the booster to allow the Starship to take advantage of the hot staging technique during stage separation. The technique involves igniting the engines on the Starship's upper stage just before stage separation while still attached to its booster stage. This will potentially increase the Starship's payload to orbit by 10%, as thrusting will not be paused during flight. After removing the hot stage ring, a platform was later constructed out to the booster from the Starship's quick disconnect arm, allowing personnel to access the top of the booster. The top of the booster forward dome houses grid fin actuators, avionics and associated components. It looks like the hot stage ring was removed to inspect that area and make necessary adjustments. On September 26, the platform was removed from the ship's quick disconnect arm, signaling the end of the works on Booster 9's forward dome. A crane then gently lifted the hot stage ring and placed it atop the booster, allowing workers to fully secure it on the booster's forward section. Ship 25 was stacked atop Booster 9 on Wednesday, September 27. It must be noted that SpaceX has not yet installed the flight termination system charges on the ship and the booster, so this is not the final stack before launch. Stacking was most likely done for fit checks with the reinstalled hot stage ring. Or we might witness a full stack wet dress rehearsal in the near future. A full speed quick disconnect retraction test was performed after the full stack. You can also see the new quick disconnect door, designed to protect ports on the quick disconnect panel from Starship exhaust, closing after the retraction of the QD arm. SpaceX will de-stack the vehicle for flight termination system installation after receiving the launch license from the FAA and then restack for launch. The flight termination system charges have already arrived at Starbase for installation on Ship 25 and Booster 9. As the second integrated flight test has been delayed, SpaceX is moving forward with pre-launch tests of the Starship and Super Heavy boosters that will be launched on future missions. Starship 26, which has already completed two cryogenic proof tests, is preparing for static fire tests on suborbital launch pad B. The ship is currently hooked to a crane to allow workers to work on and inside the ship. The vehicle already has all six Raptors fitted, and technicians are working on the engine shielding installation. Once all those works are completed, the ship will be unhooked from the crane, and teams will begin the final preparations for static fire tests. SpaceX's goal may be to jump right to a six-engine test, as they did with Ship 25, rather than the usual approach of firing one or two engines during initial tests and then testing all six engines in the end. As you may have noticed, Ship 26 differs significantly from earlier Starship prototypes in a number of ways. Please check out my previous video to find out what those design modifications are and why SpaceX implemented those changes on Ship 26. Link in the description. SpaceX began pre-launch tests on Starship 29 at its Massey's test site. SpaceX began stacking Ship 29 in May and completed the stacking operations in June. It was the first ship to use the new two-point lifting jig while being prepared for transport in the high bay. Ship 29 was rolled out to Massey's on September 22 for its cryo-proof test campaign. The first cryogenic proof test of Ship 29 took place on September 26. The ship's methane and oxygen tanks were completely filled with liquid nitrogen in about an hour during the test. The ship was held in that fully loaded state for the next two hours, and in the meantime, six hydraulic rams installed on the test stand exerted pressure on the aft section to simulate the thrust of Raptor engines. Ship 29 went through its second cryogenic proof test on Wednesday, September 27. The oxygen tank was fully filled, and the methane tank was partially loaded with liquid nitrogen this time. Apart from ensuring the reliability of the plumbing, these types of cryo-proof tests provide engineers with the data they need to determine whether a rocket can endure various kinds of stresses and whether the structure has any leaks. A Starship test tank was tested until it failed at Massey's on September 21. The test tank, labeled Ship 26.1, is a 9-meter wide eight-ring test article completed in November last year. The tank consists of an aft section that was previously slated for Ship 28 and a forward dome section with stringers. 
The tank underwent two cryoproof tests at Massey's on May 5 and 22. The test on September 21 saw the tank being filled with liquid nitrogen until the pressure inside exceeded the pressure it could withstand, resulting in the failure and destruction of the test article. The failure occurred in the center of the tank, splitting it in half. By pushing these kinds of test articles to their limits, SpaceX can determine the maximum internal stress the tanks can withstand and use the test data to improve Starship designs. Another Starship test tank was moved to Massey's on September 22. We don't know what name SpaceX designated this test tank right now, but according to the Ring Watchers community, it is the 14th of the 9-meter diameter test tank SpaceX has stacked at Starbase. Test tank 14 comprises a two-ring forward section and a three-ring aft section with stringers. Both sections are sleeved over elliptical-style domes or E-domes. SpaceX tested the first E-dome tank until failure at the Massey's site last year. At the end of the test, the tank exploded drastically, similar to ship 26.1. Perhaps the E-Dome's design elements have changed since then, and Test Tank 14 was built for a test till failure to obtain newer data to validate the dome design. Once SpaceX finalizes the elliptical dome design, such domes will replace the older Starship dome designs. The Test Tank also features new vent valve designs. SpaceX might also be testing this new valve design before implementing it on Starships. Check out this article posted by the Ring Watchers to learn about Test Tank 14 in detail. Link in the description. The aft section of Starship 27 was transported to Massey's on September 27. Ship 27 was cut in half and subsequently scrapped in July, when its common dome collapsed, most likely owing to a pressure drop inside the methane tank. Ship 27 was similar to Ship 26, without flaps and thermal protection tiles. It was once believed that the ships would be used to demonstrate Starship on orbit refueling capability. Ship 27 was relocated to the rocket garden immediately after assembly and was never tested. After arriving at Massey's, the aft section of Ship 27 was lifted and placed inside the former nosecone test cage. It looks like SpaceX is planning to conduct structural tests on Ship 27's aft section. Starship 31 stacking operations continue inside the high bay. The ship was stacked atop its liquid oxygen tank section lately. The ship will reach its full height when the aft section is joined with the already stacked sections. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Wrapping up a seven-year-long journey to the asteroid Bennu and back, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft sample return capsule touched down on Earth on Sunday, September 24. NASA launched the OSIRIS-REx mission in September 2016 atop an Atlas V rocket. After a two-year-long journey, in August 2018, the spacecraft rendezvoused with the asteroid Bennu, a 500-meter-wide carbon-rich asteroid composed mainly of silicate and nickel iron. The spacecraft then scanned and mapped the asteroid's surface for another two years. After studying the asteroid from orbit, scientists selected a location on the surface to perform a touch-and-go maneuver, in which the spacecraft would drop to the surface, briefly plunging a sampling device into the surface to collect material from the asteroid before retreating. On 20 October 2020, OSIRIS-REx descended to the asteroid's surface, collected material, and stowed it in the spacecraft sample return capsule. NASA officials said the spacecraft has collected about 250 grams of the asteroid stuff, far exceeding the mission requirement of 60 grams. In May 2021, the spacecraft left Bennu's orbit and began a 1.9 billion kilometer return trip to Earth. Over the last several weeks, OSIRIS-REx has been regularly firing its thrusters and performing trajectory correction maneuvers to ensure the successful return of the sample return capsule. On September 24, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft released the sample return capsule carrying the precious cargo on a course to land on Earth. At the time of release, the spacecraft was 101,388 kilometers from Earth, roughly one-third the distance to the Moon. After the release of the capsule, the main OSIRIS-REx spacecraft began an extended mission called OSIRIS Apex to study the 340 meters wide asteroid Apophis. The spacecraft is scheduled to arrive at Apophis in 2029, when it makes its close approach to Earth within around 32,000 kilometers. OSIRIS-REx will study the asteroid for 18 months by imaging and mapping its surface. Meanwhile, after a brief three-hour coast toward Earth's atmosphere, the sample return capsule entered Earth's atmosphere at an altitude of 132 kilometers. The capsule was traveling at the speed of 44,498 kilometers per hour at the time. One minute later, the capsule experienced peak reentry heating, and the temperature reached levels of 2,760 degrees Celsius. A drogue chute was deployed from the capsule at an altitude of 31 kilometers to provide stability during its descent and slow it down to the appropriate landing velocity. 
After slowing down for six minutes under the drogue chute, the capsule deployed the main chute, significantly slowing the capsule and bringing its speed down to the landing velocity. Finally, the sample return capsule touched down on the landing site at a speed of 17.7 km per hour, ending a 7-year and 5.8 billion km voyage through the solar system and bringing the first asteroid samples to Earth. Recovery teams were on the scene within minutes to document the condition of the capsule, looking for any signs of a breach that could cause contamination of the pristine samples inside. Teams then collected the sample return capsule and transported it to a temporary clean room at the Dugway Proving Ground in Utah. Engineers then partially disassembled the capsule by removing the heat shield and backshell so they could be transported to Lockheed Martin's facilities in Denver for analysis. The partially disassembled capsule was then sent to an environmentally clean laboratory at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. On September 26, the NASA team at Johnson Space Center opened the probe's lid in an airtight chamber, revealing black dust and debris on its avionics deck. Scientists and engineers at Johnson will work together in the coming days to complete the disassembly process before revealing the sample and the preliminary findings to the world on October 11. The sample will then be divided among different scientific institutions and world space agencies for studies and analysis. It is believed the Bennu samples will help us better understand how the early solar system formed and the origin of organics and water that led to life on Earth. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has closed its investigation into last year's failure of Blue Origin's New Shepard suborbital vehicle. The failure occurred on 12 September 2022, during New Shepard's 23rd flight, when an uncrewed research mission lifted off from Blue Origin's launch site in West Texas. The launch appeared to be going as expected until about T plus one minutes. However, at an altitude of around 8,500 meters, the plume from the hydrogen-fueled B-3 engine that powers the rocket changed its appearance, and the vehicle began to swerve slightly off vertical. The capsule's launch abort motor activated instantly, generating a quick pulse of thrust to propel the craft away from the failing rocket. The capsule, carrying research payloads, landed safely under parachutes, while the propulsion module crashed. The 36 research payloads that were launched on the mission were unharmed, and the mishap caused no injuries or property damage. Blue Origin soon initiated an investigation into the mishap, which was overseen by the FAA. In a statement released on September 27, the FAA said the anomaly was caused by a structural failure of an engine nozzle, caused by higher-than-expected engine operating temperatures. The agency added that Blue Origin must implement 21 corrective actions, including redesign of engine and nozzle components, before it can fly New Shepard again. Blue Origin posted on social media platform X that they had received the FAA letter and would be flying soon. New Shepard has not flown since the mishap, and Blue Origin cannot obtain a launch license until it can demonstrate that all necessary adjustments have been made. A Russian Soyuz spacecraft returned to Earth on September 27, bringing back two Russian and one American astronaut from the International Space Station after more than a year in orbit. NASA astronaut Frank Rubio and Russian cosmonaut Sergei Prokopyev and Dmitry Pedelin were launched to the station last September on the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft for what was originally supposed to be a six-month stay. Those plans were altered when the MS-22 spacecraft suffered a coolant leak in December. NASA and Roscosmos decided not to use the MS-22 spacecraft to bring back the crew and instead launched an uncrewed Soyuz MS-23 in February to take its place. NASA and Roscosmos extended the mission by six months, and the three spent 371 days in space, setting a record for the third longest space flight in history and the longest stay on the ISS. Rubio also broke the record for the longest single space flight by an American, breaking Mark Van High's record of 355 days set in 2021 and 2022. Prokopyev, Pedelin, and Rubio began their trip home on September 27 when they left the space station at 7.54 UTC. The undocking of Soyuz MS-23 officially marked the end of Expedition 69 and the start of Expedition 70 aboard the orbiting laboratory. Nearly three and a half hours after departing the space station, the MS-23 spacecraft performed a parachute-assisted landing in its designated landing zone in Kazakhstan. Russian and U.S. recovery crews, flight surgeons, and support personnel were standing by at the landing site to help the returning crew out of the spacecraft. According to Frank Rubio, the extended mission offered valuable experience for future long-duration missions, such as eventual missions to Mars. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.